Welcome to The Mountain Gardener with your host, Ken Lane. Gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and local advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener. Your host, Ken Lane, here every week talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona. And this is Things Are Waking Up. They're really starting to happen. What plants need is is probably two to three weeks of warmth to really start growing. Now, some of your early spring plants, probably plum, red buds, uh, these things, they, they bloom early. They don't need a lot of warmth. They just need bright days. But most plants actually need warm nights. The night is what really determines when a grape wakes up, when a crepe myrtle wakes up, when a desert willow, chitalpa, you can go crepe, you can go right down the list. There's a lot of summer plants that really just this week, they're just barely starting to see some leaves. That's because they were waiting to see if it was actually going to stay warm. They want the soil to actually warm up before they start to take off. Well, it looks like we're there now. Now, last year, if you remember, if you were gardening with us, it was cold right through May, but this year it's been warm right through May. It's a totally, this is where the mountains can really wreak havoc or, or play a difference. So our average last frost date is this weekend. This is when our average last frost for most of us in the mountains of Arizona hits. Although this year, it was the end of April. So it's a couple weeks ago we saw a frost, and we haven't seen one since. Last year it was Memorial Day. We had a frost. And so the 100-year average is about Mother's Day weekend. And so that's where it gets, that's where you need to put your gardener hat on and really start to think through, what the. look at the forecast, look at your other plants. So I look at my pansies and my violas. When they start growing like crazy, when they triple in size in the spring, going, whoa, soil's warm, days are bright, they're really growing fast, uh, I need to, I can think I can start planting now, and I do. And so it kind of, you can look for little cues from your garden that tells you, they're talking to you if you're listening as a gardener, and they'll tell you when it's, it's time to plant. One thing now you need to really watch, you need to really protect your winter plants. So it's starting to get warm, and I know it's been in the 80s. That's not really that warm for you, for me, for your plants. But what's happening right now is the air is starting to dry out. and We're starting to have a prevailing southwest wind. Have you noticed? It's always windy outside. Not not windy, I guess breezy. There's just this prevailing, ever-blowing, day and night, all the time, southwest wind. And the the humidity dropped. So we'll get down to single-digit humidity. I mean, it is bone dry. You do bone dry humidity with a prevailing southwest wind, I don't care what the temperature is outside, it's going to dry your plants out. So you need to really protect and nurture and take care of garden after your winter bloomers especially, pansies, kale, um, calendulas, your, your broccoli, your spinach, lettuce, these things love the cold nights. They like cold feet soil in there. They, the flavor comes out, the blooms start to sparkle when it's chilly out. When it starts to get in the 80s, they start to dry out more. When they're in the 90s, they have a really difficult time. You'll, you'll find it's hard to keep them watered, but it's not so much the temperature, it's the dryness. So you really want to watch how you're watering right now. So this is when I've really, I've gone through my entire system here at the garden center and also at home, and I've just walked through every valve system. So I've maintained your irrigation. You really do need to maintain it much like a car. If you're to buy a brand new Mercedes or Chevy or Cadillac or Ford, whatever it is, and you just drive it off the lot and you never do anything but put gas in it or run water through it if it's an irrigation and never do anything else to that system, how long is that new car going to run? Maybe two years and never change, never check the radiator, never ch- change the oil, never put washer fluid, never do anything to it, never check the brakes, never put any tires on it, never do anything. Well, your irrigation is like, and you pay some of your irrigation systems. I've got eight valves 
Each valve, on average, costs five seven hundred dollars to install. That's to install a valve. You got eight valves. Do the math. It costs as much as a car does sometimes, and yet we we expect these things to be out there in the open, exposed, freeze and thaw, rats, mice, javelina, gophers, and we expect them to just work. Oh, you need to go through and really touch the thing and make sure it's still operating. So I went through in the valve box. I've got um, filters in each of the boxes. I actually blew out and cleaned each of the filters. So especially if you're doing drip systems, a drip system should have a pre-filter on the water before it goes out to your drip system. The drip emitters, the emitters have such a small orifice, even one little piece of grit can clog that up and causes issues. And so I just go through and I clean that out. And it's actually kind of scary how much stuff is in our water that that little filter filters out. So it helps me maintain later in the season when the system's watering more. Then I'll walk through and I'll just check to make sure each emitter, I've got a wet spot behind each, each plant. Or if some plants are mature enough, I actually capped some off. So my, my uh, Apache plumes, a Russian sage, my yuccas, these, these hardy, drought-tough you know, local natives, I only water them for a year or two, and then I cut them off of irrigation. They don't need the water anymore, so why waste it? Some, I had some broken valves, some, not valves, broken uh, tees, had a broken elbow. I just ran it and just looked for the leaks. And, and if you run it for 30, 40, 50 minutes or a double cycle, you'll, you'll see the weak spots where that leak is it'll start to get really wet or it'll start spewing up a little stream that opens a hole up that makes it really easy to find. But I'll, I'll walk each of the valves, each of the systems or zones, and just maintain that, that, that irrigation. Then I also upped how frequent my watering was for, for my plants. And so there, I've for my container plants, I've got a lot of brand new plants. Well, they're really sensitive. They've got no roots underneath them, a big, beautiful thing. It's in bloom. It takes some moisture to, to get that thing going. So I'm now watering my container plants every day. And so I just don't want to risk. I could probably go every other day, but I just spent a whole lot of energy, time, and money on plants and fertilizers and soils and and. and What's one coming on every day instead of every other day for insurance? I'm just, I'm just making sure they're moist enough. Once they start to root out and they start to get established, I can, I can throttle it back a little bit. But right now, when plants are new in the ground, they're very sensitive, especially if they're in flower or they've got brand new foliage uh, showing. That new foliage is very tender, especially if you've got a prevailing southwest wind that's very dry, that uh, it's going to dry out that tender new growth. Once it once it thickens up, becomes tough and crusty, uh, then then it then it can take on more of this dryness and not be a problem. It's now through the end of June. The next six weeks is really the toughest gardening you'll ever find anywhere in the country, right here in the mountains of Arizona. And it's because of that that southwest wind and the dryness. So you just got to get plants to limp through. Your water bill will spike through June. Once that monsoon pattern happens, July 4th, you can almost count on it. It may not rain in the afternoon, but definitely there's a cloud cover. The humidity goes from virtually nothing to 30-40%, which is very high. I mean, I melt in the humidity if it's above 25%. I'm going, oh, it's so gooey. How do the people on the East Coast stand this? Oh my gosh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna melt before eyes. I'm melting. <laughs> Your plants they're going to love that. So they're going to love that humidity that's coming. But there's this dry spell now through June. And it's not so much the, the heat. It's not so much the brightness. It's the dryness with the wind. That's what dries things out. So just protect things. Water a little bit more. Increase the watering just a touch. And that'll make a difference. I would do it on your lawn. I do it on your vegetables. I do it on your flowers. Those are the most sensitive uh, and then I'll have some tricks for you later on. I can show you how to get things to really bloom. If those roses haven't quite popped, if your Russian sage isn't quite going, if your autumn, they aren't quite wanting to bloom yet, I got an insider trick. I'll share what I did this week in my own gardens. It'll make it, it'll be a big game changer in your own gardens. It'll bring things back to life like you have not seen in colored life. But for now, we've got Lisa Watersland coming in with your garden questions. We'll be right back after this. 
You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane, owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him every week for timely garden advice right for the gardens. Visit Ken where he can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Waters Garden Companion Plants in May are Purple Robe Locusts, Vine and Achevia, Prescott Sunshine Geraniums, and Easy Elegant Roses. Just plant these roses in a sunny spot and enjoy. We've married the beauty of long stem roses with the easy care of shrub roses for landscape color like no other plant in the backyard. Choose fragrant reds, radiant pinks, corals, vivacious yellows, and stately whites. Extremely fragrant and only found locally at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Gee, my flowers just bloom too much. Said no one, ever. Hi, this is Kenneth Waters. We had a crazy winter and everyone's ready for flowers in the garden. Waters Flower Power is made specifically for Arizona that gives flowers that extra boost to burst into bloom. It's an energy kick in the plants. Get ready for roses that rule, peppers that pop, and tomatoes that triumph. More power to the flowers with Flower Power at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. You've been listening to Ken Lane, the Mountain Gardener. Green thumbs learned while working in the Family Garden Center. Now welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. And we're back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week with garden questions, just what's going on in other gardeners' world, and can we share that? Can you learn some things? So welcome to the studio, Lisa. Thank you. It's been busier than ever at You're the Garden busy. Center. Yeah. It's kind of fun. When, when was that? On Wednesday night, mm -hmm. the whole family just stayed late and merchandised houseplants. We ordered pizzas from Two Mamas, our favorite <laughs> pizza place to go. Yeah. Uh, we love uh, dry gulches, margaritas. Can we say that over the airwaves? I don't know. <laughs> Merchandising after hours, pizzas and food and just family and fun and uh, plants. Uh, we are, we're a plant family. We yes. we like we like plants from the kids from the youngest from our grandkids to mm -hmm. our oldest kids. Me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fun working with them because they're like, "Oh, mom, what's this plant? Will it grow? How was it a yeah. need?" And it's just so. But it's fun working with them. They are. I have to say, we raised some great kids and some really hard workers. You know what's fun to watch is they're trying to pitch in because we know we're being overwhelmed. There's not a lot of of there's there's more customers, less staff. The, the retired folks kind of self quarantines. There's less of us to do more. Just mm -hmm. uh, and and they jumped in to help us. So they moved back to Prescott to help us out, and we helped them out by giving yep. them a job. But they've they've appreciated us more, and then to, they want to help. They want to be there, which is what family does for family. Mm -hmm. um, and then it feeds off each other. They're seeing each. Each kid, there's four kids here. They're all seeing how their, their, their siblings doing, and they want to help more. So it's almost like an energy thing that feeds on itself. It's fun. I never saw that coming, <laughs> but it's fun to watch. This is a be this event, this this whatever we're going to call this when we're all done, virus, economic, whatever thing. Right. Um, this is going to be a memory point for us and our family. I think the Lane family uh, here working at Waters Garden Center together. We're going to talk about this for generations. I mean, we will be gone. Uh, <laughs> Speak for yourself. And then our grand, our great grandkids will be talking. Oh, I can remember Pop Pop talking about the great economic <laughs> thing of 2020 and how the family rallied. And yeah. I think there'll be a lot of stories like that. So yeah. anyway, yeah. food drives. You've seen food drives big time here. Yeah. You'll see food drives coming. I remember when we gathered up and we went to the store and we donated we drove by and had our masks on and we gave food so that people could you, there'll be stories like that humanitarian just uh, family connections yeah so. i think th i think you know it's a it's a hard thing it's not easy for a lot of people but um in the end i i think there'll be a lot of positives that come out of this at least i hope there will but there has to be you know, there's always yeah. good with bad that so. is true. but enough about good or bad just how about garden questions? Garden, 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 Mes garden. Mesmerize us with great questions. <laughs> well, Joel, he wants to pick out a gift for a friend, and he yeah. wants a very fragrant rose. Oh, sure. He wants to know, what would you recommend? Oh, so roses. What's interesting, what's happening with roses, it's a super interesting thing. It's changed. So your grandparents always grew hybrid teas mm -hmm. and floribundas and these 
kind, kind of complicated roses, and they bred them to be more and more beautiful, larger and larger flowers, and they bred out some of the fragrance. Well, now they've, the pendulum has swung, and now gardeners want not as much care. They want less care, and they want more fragrance. And so we're introducing a whole series. In fact, the way we, we've had well over a 1,000 roses show up this week. All of them, we, we shop for those by petal count, that is number of petals, how, how many, how, how frilly the flower is, and then by fragrance. So, so most of our flowers that we have, most of the roses we have are fragrant. But now there's three different types. There's hybrid teas, that's your traditional long-stemmed rose. That's the most formal, that's the one everyone thinks about. It takes a little bit more care, but you can get a bigger flower on a long stem, cut them, bring them indoors, give them as gifts, whatever. That, that's a long stem rose. Floribundas, which are more of a long stem rose for the landscape. Not really made to cut off and bring indoors, but it's got a long stem with a cluster of, of not just one flower, but many smaller flowers all together on the end of a rose. Many of those are quite fragrant. Then you've got grandifloras, which is they blended the two together. I don't know how they do this stuff. It's a bigger rose. It'll be head high at least. And then it's got long stem roses and floribunda roses on the same plant. Uh, so same bush. It's magnificent. If you need to screen your neighbor, dogs are barking, people are cutting across your, your yard, well, grandifloras, that'll cut them. That'll st- then you get into specialized roses. Climbing roses. So they get just big. They crawl up trellises, limbs. They just they climb. You've got ground cover roses. They're not quite as fragrant, but they just stay really low and they trail across. So up and down our driveways, carpet roses. It's a pretty easy care. They take no care. They self prune themselves. They bloom from May through through October. They're just amazing, and they stay low. And then lastly, you get into shrub roses. Here's where life gets interesting with roses. Shrub roses, there's no graft. Now, most roses are, are grafted onto a hardier rootstocks. You can get this huge flower. Here, they've now developed an entire series of, of shrubs that don't have a graft. They're on their own rootstock. If winter comes and takes them back to the ground, they come back pure like they were. So this is, this, this is sophisticated. Now, typically... That was called a knockout rose. That's what introduced the whole whole train of thought with this. Well, now we've got probably 30 different types of shrub roses, variations of knockouts. And now they've figured out how to breed in the fragrance. It's almost a, a long stem rose, but it's a shrub rose. It's, it's like a four by four by four. It self prunes. They don't get bugs. The, the less care, less less techniques. A novice should start with a shrub rose and move up to a hybrid tea flora, bunda grandiflora. flora. Uh, but now we got some fragrance with some of these roses. So what's my favorite rose that's most fragrant? <laughs> I figured you were dodging the question. Oh, my gosh. There's so <laughs> many varieties. Fragrant cloud. I just, uh, on uh, Facebook Live, I went on and showed the roses. It's legend. Mm-hmm. This rose, it's as big as your hand. It's red. Oh, it's yeah. it's, it's glorious. Uh, Grace and Grits is a new one that just came out. That's a shrub rose, very fragrant. There's one come in and let your nose do the picking. You know, that is so true because everybody has a different scent true. that they like and things that I like, you know, the next person would be like, oh my gosh, that's just too much. You, know? so <laughs> you do kind of got to go in and, and look for the colors you like and the smells you like. It's definitely Some have a rose smell. Some have a, a, a sweet pea smell. Some have a, a lighty, light, like like pansy kind of smell. It just, just depends. Right, right. So come on down and shop all those roses. Next question is from Shirley. She moved into a home that already had an existing yard with large trees and shrubs. Her question is, the drip irrigation on the large trees, the emitters are right up against the trunk. Yeah. She wants to know, is that okay, or should she move them out further? So at the base of any plant, tree, shrub, vine, whatever, uh, at the very base of 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 a tree are anchoring roots. These are big, hairy, big, barky roots. They actually are unable to take in moisture or nutrients. So if you're putting all your energy of water and food right at the base of a plant, you're basically wasting it. 
uh, you want to move most of the feeder roots. These are very fine uh, white hairs that grow through the roots, through the soil. They're out towards what's called the drip line. So if you were to stand straight up in your living room right now as you listen to this program, you hold your hand straight out, your trunk, your, your, your body would be the trunk, and the outer branches would be your fingertips. Ideally, you want that drip emitter out to the elbows, to your fingertips. Somewhere out there are where the feeder roots are, and that's where you want to focus most of your fertilizer and water. And so it is, you do need to keep up with your drip system to have healthy plants. Otherwise, they'll tend to blow over. They'll be very shallow rooted. Uh, when the monsoons come, they'll, they'll, the winds will come. They'll, they'll knock them over, that kind of stuff. So to, to tune that system up is, is an ideal. You just clip that emitter off, extend the line out, you put a T on it, and usually you have two emitters where that one was further out. Mm -hmm. You might have two or three sets out around that. So yeah, it's very much uh, the time to tune up those drip systems and move, physically move those emitters out from the base. It's a good idea. All right, Ken and Lisa Lane, great questions this week. We will be back with more after this. You're listening to Ken Lane, a.k.a. The Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week in Prescott at Waters Garden Center. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain gardens. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our Victory Pyracantha. It's impossible to kill this evergreen shrub. Your garden victory is assured. Birds will nest and revel amongst the cluster of bold red berries. Thick enough to hedge and screen, yet tall enough to use as a windbreak. A big, bold plant is just $59 and sure to impress your garden friends. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love Victory Gardens, they love to shop. Waters Garden companion plants in May are Indian Hawthorn, Purple Robe Locust, Prescott Sunshine Geraniums, and Vining Akebia. Akebia is a super vigorous vine with dangling fragrant flowers. She proliferates up arbors, pergolas, fences, and stunning as a ground cover to retain hills. One of the fastest growing evergreen vines you can plant in the gardens. you only find the hardiest vines at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Join the conversation every week as he answers timely garden questions. Email Ken a question directly from your phone to his desktop through the web at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Now welcome back your host, Ken Lane. If you have a few plants that are in the yard, let's say they've been there for years, and they just seem to be waking up slowly, here's, here's a little secret. Here's what I did in my own yards, and I predict within... Oh, a week, 10 days, they'll be in full bloom. So I've got some Russian sage, some dwarfed Russian sage out front by the road. I want them to be in bloom. They, they impress the neighbors. They look good. They greet me when I come home and they go, welcome. I'm so glad you're back. We missed you. I've got some autumn sage does the same, same thing. Some carpet roses. These are low growing, kind of knee high and below roses that just flow out along the driveway. I want those things in bloom. And normally they're in bloom. By Mother's Day, they're just late. They're, they're they're just late. They're just late this year. Well, not for long. Here's what I did. I cleaned them up. So anything that's dead on a on a plant, I don't care what it is. Anytime there's dead stuff in a plant, a tree, a shrub, a, a, a perennial flower, anything, uh, clip it off. Because dead things attract more death and decay. So there's bugs that roll around looking for plants that are stressed out. And one indication is they can smell dead wood. They just figure it out. And so they'll come in and start to eat the dead wood, and then it attracts, and it's a party, then more bugs are attracted. You do want to clean up any dead limbs. You don't wait till winter when your traditional pruning is done. You do that major pruning, shaping then, but then throughout the year, you just clip off broken branches, that snow from a month and a half ago, got a bunch of broken branches on things. You clean those things up. Then what I did is I mixed up a few gallons of flower power. It's a f special fertilizer I make here at the garden center that, that brings plants back to life and quickly. I mean, it's available phosphorus right now for the plant. 
And so phosphorus is nitrogen, phosphorus, potash. That middle number in your fertilizers, that's the number that brings out the flowers, the fragrance, the fruits. And so this is 48% phosphorus with a whole bunch of minerals, you know, iron and boron and copper and magnesium, things that plants really take up and need. It keeps them healthy looking. So if the plants are a little yellow, give them flower power. If they just aren't quite blooming the way you want them to, give them flower power. Clean them up, give them flower power, and they will. This just becomes available to the plant. It takes it up. I mean, right now it takes it up. Uh, right now, even if you fertilized some of those plants, let's say two months ago, back in March, with an all-purpose food, that's great. Uh, that's the steak and potatoes, the one that just slowly breaks down and methodically over the next three, four months feed your plants. But if you want a hyper juice, you want to just, just give your plants, I mean, plants on crack. This is what flower power is. It's crack for, for plants. Can you say that over the airwaves? Well, I just we just did. Until we get a cease and assist, flower power is like crack for, for, for plants. Anyway, I gave it to my roses, my Russian sage, uh, some lantanas, some crepe myrtles, just some things. I want them to pop now. I'm tired of waiting for them to wake up. I want to force them out out of hibernation like right now. And I gave maybe a gallon to each plant. It's, it's water soluble. It's got a little scoop in it. You put it in your little watering can. You walk out there and just nurture things back to life. It works. It's made for flower power is actually made for containers, flower baskets. So this weekend, we are literally going to sell hundreds, literally hundreds of hanging baskets. We're noted for our hanging baskets, where there's geraniums, petunias, calipricoas, mixtures thereof. Uh, we were kind of famous for our hanging baskets. And so we're selling hundreds of those. Well, what happened was about a month later after Mother's Day, they're giving them as gifts. They're just decorating the back door. They're having a barbecue with mom on the back. And kids are just gathering. Uh, about a month later, they would stop blooming because they would run out of food. And so the flower power I developed probably 10 years ago. I've been tweaking that recipe for years now, but I've made that so that we could bring those plants back into bloom, back into flower, back into beauty, and keep them blooming. So whenever I've got a customer that's walking out with a cartload of, of flowers, I always go, oh, here, take this. I just hand it to them so they don't question it. You, you'll need one of these to keep all of those flowers blooming. But it also works not just in hanging baskets, not just in container gardens or raised beds, but it can also bring out those roses, I mean, like right now. While I mention roses, uh, we got a 1,000 roses here at the garden center last weekend. I'm kind of spent. I look like I've been in a cat fight. I've got scars everywhere up and down my arms and legs, but they're beautiful. They landed, and they were perfectly clean. I had to spray those a couple nights ago with with a aphid killer. Aphids just found like like went vroom, like a vacuum on them. So I started to see um, aphids show up on the roses that just arrived. So I know that they were airborne. I know they flew in. They saw a free meal, and I sprayed them with triple action. So look for for aphids out in the yard, especially your roses. Uh, yeah. Apples, what else are they on? Flowers, vegetables, they'll be on those. Spray them with this organic triple action, and it kills the aphids. And more importantly, it's got a repelling action to it. So it's made of neem oil, so it just kind of keeps them away too. Makes it makes the plant taste and smell bad to aphids. It really works. Anyway, where did I go with that? That's it for this segment. We'll be right back with more on The Mountain Gardener. The Mountain Gardener, your source for timely garden advice right for higher elevations. Guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Water's garden companion plants in May are purple robe locusts, vining achevia, Prescott sunshine geraniums, and easy elegant roses. Just plant these roses in a sunny spot and enjoy. We've married the beauty of long stem roses with the easy care of shrub roses for landscape color like no other plant in the backyard. Choose fragrant reds, radiant pinks, corals, vivacious yellows, and stately whites. Extremely fragrant and only found locally at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. 
Waters Garden companion plants in May are Vining Akebia, Purple Robe Locust, Prescott Sunshine Geraniums, and Indian Hawthorn. Wind is no problem for this Indian Hawthorn. Rose-colored flowers cover this spring bloomer that often repeat blooms in fall. Dark blue berries adorn this compact bush that takes the wind and soaks up the sun like a native. Perfect for low-maintenance gardens with virtually no pruning, ever. Every backyard should have at least one, and only found here at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert, Ken Lane. Mountain gardening is very rewarding, with a few of Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts sure to turn your thumbs even greener. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week and just shares her her garden perspective, an, another angle to, in the garden. So we yep. have beautiful gardens ourselves, mm-hmm. and uh, we tag team a lot of those. We this, do. This week it's been uh, adjust the irrigation and fix the pond so the birds have water. <sighs> that pond, big, oh my goodness. It's it is, beautiful. It's 15 years old. It just I takes know. a little maintenance. Well, that and the black lab gets in it yeah. all the time. <laughs> it's the dogs. They keep swimming in them. It was fine until we got the Labrador Retriever. And oh. then he loves the water. I'm kind of hot. I'm going for a swim. He does. He, <laughs> he just, just wades right in. Hangs out in there for a few minutes. And <laughs> then comes and runs in the house and yeah, gets water. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But, yeah, that'll be nice to have that back up. And we got our fountain growing going in the front again. Yeah. So the, I was sitting out there the other day, and the hummingbirds were truly enjoying All over that. it. Yeah. yeah. So anything that's got a motor, a solenoid, a clock... You just have to maintain. It's like mm-hmm. like anything, like your computer. They just get old, and you got to maintain them. You got to declutter them. You got to upgrade. You got to security patches. You got to, well, your your motors sometimes they burn out or they get clogged up, or you need to get the filters changed. Or mm-hmm. uh, you, so we we cleaned out the filters and the irrigation, cleaned out the filters on the skimmers and the the, the filter boxes, and got it, cleaned the water. And while I was cleaning the hot tub, I figured why not take that and put it in the pond and then refill that. And so it's just kind of this domino effect of work in the backyard. But boy, it's beautiful when it's done. Oh my it gosh. Is, You're yeah. done for a while. Right, right. So. And everything looks so pretty right now. Most things yeah. have leafed out. They're starting to bloom. Wonderful time to be out in the yard. It is. So <laughs> what kind of garden tips do you have for us? Well, we've had quite a few customers come in who have uh, bought pretty things, wonderful things, put them in the yard, and the next day they come out and they're either half gone or totally gone. <laughs> yeah. Um, so <laughs> talk about the vermin. Yes. So there's a lot of critter activity right now between yeah. the javelina and the bunnies and the deer and even pack rats are yeah. out there. So, um, you know, and, and people get frustrated and I totally understand that. But there's some things you can do to help mitigate that critter problem that you would have in your yard. Oh, yeah. So yeah, that's a great idea. Mm-hmm. Very apropos. Yes. So first thing is, I mean, get rid of those things that are attracting the critters into your yard. So if you're putting out like quail blocks, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm going to tell you the javelina will hunt that down yeah. like no others. So bird seed. And yeah, I know we want to feed the birds and all that kind of stuff, but you know, you got to pick what you want there because you will attract uh, a lot of rats. You'll attract the javelina. Um, that's just what they love. Squirrels, chipmunks, you can keep on down. Porcupine, possums. Possums. There are no possums, possums, possums here. No, no here. possums. Groundhogs up north. <laughs> <laughs> Go first. That's yeah. we have. And second thing, plant the things that you know they're not going to like. Yeah. So if you put a whole pallet of things out there that they're just going to think is, you know, a salad bar, of course they're going to come in and eat. So go for those plants that you know are pretty foolproof with those guys. And the other thing I would say, especially if you're planting a brand new plant, and, and I really recommend this with javelina, is use a repellent right away. Sometimes I think that the smell of the fresh dug earth and... You know, javelinas love that because they think they love the grubs and the insects that live in the soil. So if they smell that fresh, fresh dirt, they're like, ooh, maybe I there's think something there. Animals, they <laughs> notice when something's new in their environment. They're living in the backyard underneath the oak trees in the back. Right. And then they're coming out every night, checking out, going, oh, let's see what's new. What, what do they do today? Yeah. 
And so the deer will notice when a new tree's in, the javelina will notice when a new flower's in, the bunnies will notice, they notice, and they take interest. Right. It's not like they're going, doo, 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 wonder what's new. No, they, they actually go, well, that's new. Right. Let's go see what it is mm-hmm. and experiment with this. So if you put a repellent on it, it just naturally goes, ooh, yuck. Right. This is every time they plant out here, it's always nasty. Why are they <laughs> doing this? Because most of them are very habitual. So if they, you know, go up to it a few times and it smells nasty and bad, yeah. they'll just learn, hey, I don't like that. I'll leave it alone. I'll go see what the neighbors down the road have going on that's probably better. So definitely using those repellents. But the main thing I think is planting from the palate of things we know they don't like. And when it comes to perennials, um, a lot of the... My favorite go-to with a perennial is got to be the Salvia Gregii or the Autumn Sage. And that is such a, um, I love that plant because it is so resistant. It blooms all season long. It can take full hot sun, but it can also go into a shadier part in the yard and be just as happy. And they've come up with so many new colors now. It used to be red. You got red. All you had was red. And now it's red. It's purple. It's raspberry. It's apricot. It's red and white. The hot lips is red and white. They've come out with a ignition white one that is absolutely gorgeous. It really shows up with those white blossoms in the yard. I, I haven't seen that one. I'll take a look. <laughs> is really that pretty. in stock right now? Mm-hmm. They've got, oh, you must have just got it's a new yeah, variety in. It is. New. Ooh, that's <laughs> exciting. So that's definitely one of my go-tos. The other one that I really love is cat mint. And everybody goes, well, is it going to attract the cats? <laughs> they go, no, it's not cat nip, it's cat mint. And it's a real pretty little mounding shrub, good for those low, where you want a low spot, maybe in the front of a bed or along a driveway. Little purplish blue flowers on it. But that thing is so resistant. And when it's established, it's crazy drought hardy. Yeah. Comes back wonderfully every, every year. My favorites are lavender and rosemary. I agree. I just like, we've got a lot yeah. of those. We mm-hmm. do a lot. I mean, I love this brush up against them, the smell. Oh, yeah. and they bloom early. They bloom late. Animals don't like them. They take full sun. You can abuse them and they don't die. That's true. So anything That's herbally, mm-hmm. animals aren't. They Animals don't like herbs. They don't like the smell of herbs like right. people do. But yeah. that, that's just something to think about. We Have Have you seen the, uh, what's it called? Platinum blonde yeah. lavender we have yeah. up there. It's a variegated lavender. Yeah. We very, have very one of those pretty. planted in the herb garden. We do? Yeah, down the side side path. And I've hardly watered it. And it's yeah. still, it's looking great. It's not quite in bloom yet. So okay. it's about the same stage as those that we just got in. Uh-huh. But we've had been out there, I think I planted that last fall. Okay. And it's coming back looking great. Yeah. So that's definitely lavenders and rosemaries. Definitely anything kind of really in that herb family. Uh, coneflower or echinacea is yeah. another great one. And so um, those things that have those sticky leaves to them or feel kind of rough or sandpapery or hairy. I mean, none of the critters really want to eat those because it just kind of gets stuck in their throat and, you know, they have to hack it up. So. <laughs> plants are brilliant. They're, they're oh, coming yeah. up with defenses mm-hmm. to keep the animals off. And these are the ones that have figured it out and you can plant in your yard and they're not going to bother. But echinacea, right. gallardias, coneflowers, those are all great yeah. choices. They do very, very nicely. Spireas. Yeah. Uh, which when you look at a spirea, I sit there and go, oh, there's no way that's animal resistant. But they don't bother that thing at all. Yeah. It's a really pretty summer blooming shrub for out in the yard. Um, of course, potentias is another yeah. one that's real pretty summer blooming. Now, my question for you, because I didn't know the answer to this. Here we go. Here's the test. Because <laughs> I, I, I think I know, but I'm not sure. I'll see what your opinion is. Um, hydrangeas. Yeah. Nice, beautiful shade plant for here. We've gotten some beautiful ones in. Are they animal resistant? Well, I can, I've got proof. So we're at the office. So mm-hmm. this is a studio here at the garden center. We've got test gardens out there. And on either side of the front patio are two hydrangeas on both sides. Mm-hmm. And javelina and deer and rabbits roam free in the front where those things are. And they consistently bloom every single year. They're coming back right now. So they're just starting. They're maybe six, four inches mm-hmm. high. They're coming back again. And so I've got proof. Javelina don't bother hydrangeas. I got proof. Deer don't bother <laughs> hydrangeas because they're right out there where yeah. they can get to them. And right. we're right up against the forest. So mm-hmm. yeah. I would say, yeah, they're good okay. to go. I thought so, but I just wasn't 100% sure. If in doubt, 
Yeah. Plant one test victim. Don't commit <laughs> all the way. Just put one. See how they do it. You'll know night one if they're oh, going to yeah. eat it because they're all interested. They're looking mm-hmm. at it going, oh, well, that's something new. What's, What's going on? And so you'll know before you, so don't buy six of them. Just, just buy one. <laughs> right. See how it does. And then if it survives like the first few nights, come back and get the other five. That's great and, advice. And away you go. Yeah. All right, Lisa. Great advice. Uh, lots of animal proof i would say plants you can plant both both shrubs and perennial flowers you can have out in the yard here at waters garden center thank you lisa we'll be right back with more after this look for more tips tricks and garden shortcuts through ken's website podcast the show read his weekly garden column or follow him on facebook and instagram at watersgardencenter.com That's Waters with two T's, GardenCenter.com. Waters Garden Companion Plants in May are Indian Hawthorn, Purple Robe Locust, Prescott Sunshine Geraniums, and Vining Akebia. Akebia is a super vigorous vine with dangling fragrant flowers. She proliferates up arbors, pergolas, fences, and stunning as a ground cover to retain hills. One of the fastest growing evergreen vines you can plant in the gardens. You only find the hardiest vines at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Waters companion plants in May are Vining Akebia, Indian Hawthorn, Prescott Sunshine Geraniums, and Purple Robe Locusts. Incredible long clusters of purple flowers in May that look just like wisteria flowers hanging from this local bloomer. The 8-inch fragrant flowers cover the tree profusely. Super hardy and drought tolerant with a brisk growth rate of 2 feet in 1 year. It's just the perfect backyard shade tree. You'll find the shadiest trees here at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Welcome to the Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane. Gardening in the mountains is different. Listen to Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts guaranteed to make your gardens more beautiful than ever this year. Now for better advice that works locally, welcome your host, Ken Lane. So the vegetable gardens, they are in at the Lane Casa. We've got most of them. i got to accessorize a little bit, but the pumpkins are starting to grow. Squashes are starting to upsize. Cucumbers are in. Uh, the uh, tomatoes are up pretty good, maybe maybe knee high. Uh, mo- most of them. So peppers are starting to show a little bit of a flower color. Here's some insider tips on really getting the most out of your out of the production of your vegetable gardens, the edible things. So I won't touch on fruit trees and brambles, pomegranates, but mainly the the vegetable garden itself. Uh, it's it's all about nutrients. And so what you'll find is you front-loaded your vegetable gardens with all these manures and richness and fertilizers up front. So the soil was perfect. It was just waiting to receive plants. Finally, the days, they warmed up. The nights, the soil started to warm up, so the plants started to grow. Now, most of your vegetables, they are tropical plants. They do not like the mountains of Arizona except for in the summer, and that's it. These plants like the warmth, the, the sun. They like it. The warmer, the better they are. And so it's we're finally warm where they're actively growing, going, okay, here we go. We're taking off. And so I'm starting. I can see that maybe I'll have some tomatoes here shortly. They'll start to form. Some peppers will start forming. Um, once they start growing for about six weeks, then they'll all of a sudden just stop. It's, 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 I don't, it's a weird thing. So, and I think it comes down to the nutrients and the soil amendments that you put in there. So you started out with a rich soil, you planted some plants, they started to grow like crazy. They've used that nutrients and now we're starting to water more because it's dry and it's windy. It's this prevailing Southwest wind. So you need to water a little more. Now you've flushed out some nutrients. And so about six weeks in, your plants will be left wanting for some more nutrients. Well, don't be afraid to reapply some more vegetable food. And so for me, I will, I'll, I'll sprinkle some more fruit and vegetable food. We make our own organic fertilizers, little pelletized organic food. I'll sprinkle some of that out to, oh, the end of June, something like that, maybe a little bit sooner, definitely before the monsoons hit July 4th. Sometime in July, there's this wet pattern that happens through the summer months here in the mountains of Arizona. It's kind of uniquely southwestern. I'll get it on before that. Um, 
then I'll probably supplement. I might even, especially my container gardens, I might even juice them a little bit with some flower power. There's this liquid, very accessible plant food. If they look yellow at all, I'll give them flower power in addition to the uh, fruit and vegetable foods. Kind of it's a tag team thing. Now, for my things that get blossom and rot, things that grow really fast but then forget to bloom, so tomatoes, uh, squash are, are notorious for that. Uh, eggplants can be, can be a problem. So some plants, I, I'll get two bottles here at the garden center. One's called Rot Stop, and the other one's called Blossom Set. So I've got two bottles of, of these things. I've got them at my gardens right now, and I'll start spritzing as soon as that first notice of even one flower on that plant. I'll start once a month, or once a month, once a week, giving my plants, spritzing the foliage of my plants with the rot stop and the blossom set. Rot stop, blossom set. What they do, tomatoes are notorious for growing like crazy, and they actually have this huge plant, and they forget to blossom or set fruits. That's because you might have juiced the soil a little too much with nitrogen. So with tomatoes, uh, you want to, you want them to grow up fast, and then you want to you neglect them basically. You want to starve them of nitrogen, give them phosphorus and potash, so to get to prevent them from from growing too much. So if they get in this pattern where they just grow, 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 they get in their head. They're just kind of going, okay, this is all I'm programmed to do. Just grow more vines, more vines, more vines. And so the blossom set, you spritz it on the foliage, and it slows them down, lets them take a breather. So it's actually, it just stunts them real quick, only for a couple days, where they kind of go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Just, just spritz, 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 blossom set. Slows them down to where they can actually reset and go, oh, yeah, that's right. I should probably set a, set a few flowers here. It's not a pollinator. It doesn't pollen. It's not a pollen inducer. It doesn't set that, that flower, force it to set. What it does is it slows the plant down. That's why you want a large size. You want a quart size. You can get a gallon if you can, a blossom set. And I do most of the vegetable garden. Anything that forms a fruit, I'll spritz it with that because it does get you more fruits and upsizes the fruits that you might have, especially for tomatoes, peppers, squash. These are things that are notorious for growing fast, for getting to set fruit. That's what the blossom set is for. So I'll do that every other week. In between, I use rot stop. Rot stop is a calcium layer. Now, I front load my soil with a bunch of calcium already. Our fruit and vegetable food, 7% of that is calcium, just because I know we're having blossom end rot issues. When we start watering a lot and we've got a heavy soil, what happens is there's nutrients in the soil, but it gets locked up because the soil is too wet, too soggy, and the plants are rooting in that. They can see it but they're just so soggy, they can't take it in. They can't, when the ground gets too wet and there's not enough oxygen, the plant locks up, just goes, I'm not, I'm not taking in calcium now or, or iron or magnesium or anything. I'm just going to sit here and try to, try to survive. Well, if plants are like that and you know you're going to get some blossom in rot, which is typically caused by overwatering, oh, well, then you can spritz rot stop on the foliage again, where the plant can have direct access to calcium right through their foliage. Calcium is what brings out the flavor, the size, the color of vegetables. And so you spritz it on the foliage, not the, not the fruit. Don't focus on the fruit. You're focusing on the foliage. And all of a sudden, this plant will start taking in the calcium and you'll get larger fruits, more of them. So that's the in-between route. So every week, I'm just spritzing out a light spritz. We're not watering it down. We're just spritzing lightly the foliage with rot stop, and blossom, and rot. Those are those two things. That That is a game changer for the mountains of Arizona. Part of it's because our nights are so chilly. There's such a large swing between day and nighttime temperature. That's going to play with your plants some that maybe you're not familiar with from a Midwest garden or, or more, more coastal, more temperate climates. Here, it affects your plants. Those two things, fertilizing more regularly, and then rot stop and blossom set. Just, just switching those things off once a week, spritz a little bit. Um, the other thing I noticed too for, for myself, now I'm just, now other things are popping in my mind. Now my tomatoes, I make sure I don't let 
Anything, my, the foliage touch the ground. Tomatoes, they want to become diseased. They want to die from disease. They want spotting, curling, vertinitum wilts. They want, if it's possible, if there's a disease anywhere within a one mile radius of your tomato plant, it wants it. It like has a magnet, just draws it in. And most of that is coming from soil borne viruses. Soil-borne bacteria is that, that as you water, it splashes up onto the foliage, causes spotting, yellowing, curling. And so I know that's where most of the problems come from. So I just don't let the foliage, I don't let anything splash into the foliage because the foliage is not close enough to the ground. I totally cheat. I'm just not going to let this thing touch the ground. Everything's in cages. They grow up into the fresh air, the, the bright light, the dryness is good. For, for tomato plants especially, are just so prone to disease. And so if I can keep them bright and airy in the dry air, they don't get disease. If they get close to the ground, the soil goes all COVID on them. They just start jumping up and those bottom leaves start curling. Once it starts curling, they start moving up the plant. And all of a sudden, the entire middle section of your tomato plant just is defoliating, yellow, curled. If the whole plant starts to curl itself, that's called vertinitum wilt. There's no cure for that. The only remedy, and this, this happens midsummer, the plant's up three feet tall and it's curling like crazy, stop setting fruit, and it spreads so easily that the only way to cure that is you pull it up out of the ground and you burn it. You get rid of it. You put it in the trash can, have the trash man haul it off. You don't compost it because it's such a problem in your tomato gardens. It can just spread right through. It's called vertinillum wilt. So it's usually is caused from the soil. Water splashes down, jumps back up, gets in the foliage, or a bug, I guess, or a bird can light on a place and then gets up on your plant, and then it just starts spreading like that. So keep close eyes on those tomato plants especially. Keep them from getting diseased, and you'll have a better production this year. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott, 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener. Gee, my flowers just bloom too much. Said no one, ever. Hi, this is Kenneth Waters. We had a crazy winter and everyone's ready for flowers in the garden. Waters Flower Power is made specifically for Arizona that gives flowers that extra boost to burst into bloom. It's an energy kick in the plants. Get ready for roses that rule, peppers that pop, and tomatoes that triumph. More power to the flowers with Flower Power at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Waters Garden Companion Plants in May are Purple Robe Locusts, Vine and Achevia, Prescott Sunshine Geraniums, and Easy Elegant Roses. Just plant these roses in a sunny spot and enjoy. We've married the beauty of long stem roses with the easy care of shrub roses for landscape color like no other plant in the backyard. Choose fragrant reds, radiant pinks, corals, vivacious yellows, and stately whites. Extremely fragrant and only found locally at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. You've tuned in to The Mountain Gardener with local garden expert Ken Lane. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions that are sure to make a difference in your gardens. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. In the Lane backyard, we have a lot of edibles, lots of colors, and basically a flower grower. I love flowers. I love butterflies and hummingbirds. And really, we, we do garden for the birds. We have a lot of birds from, from quail. I've seen eagles. I mean, bald eagles fly over our backyard, uh, kestrels, uh, quail, flycatchers, sparrows. I mean, you name it, everything in between. Uh, we, we actually garden for the birds to bring them in. In the morning, it's, it's riotous. I mean, it's just so many, it's so loud. It's just fun to listen to them chanter back and forth, singing to each other, responding back and forth. But we've got plants for them. We've got water for them. I don't feed the birds other than I've got flowers. Yeah, how many birds are like? I have seed type of, of plants like gallardia. We've got an Arizona gallardia uh, here. It's a perennial that, that we sell. It is the best 
for, for seed-loving birds because it throws on these great big six-inch flowers that have lots of seed to them. Birds just love those. And it comes back every year. Animals, the javelina, the deer, rabbits, they don't eat gallardia. But the birds love them. Again, that's perfect in my backyard. I, I want one of those. They love full sun. I need more of those. They come in a couple colors. That's perfect. And so I've got lots of plants like that, echinaceas, uh, coreopterus. There's a lot of different perennial flowers that they're attracted to. And then I've got the cover for them. So I've got trees where they feel comfortable. But the main thing right now to watch after your birds, if you want to attract more birds, make sure water is back there. So... I've got a pond with a little water feature. It's, it's, it's pretty nice. It sounds really good. I like it. Uh, we love to entertain. We'll sit back at the back and just watch a sunset, overlook in the Granite Dells, listen to the water rustling down the backyard. It's magical. But the birds in the evening, they just, they love that. So right now, since it's getting so dry, it's in the 80s, the humidity is virtually non-existent. There's a prevailing southwest wind. It's drying things out. And so there you need to watch after your birds. Any amount of water can be a game changer. If you've got a little muddy patch, sometimes you can create a drip system, add a dripper to your system, and, and just make a little, uh, like a mud basin just for the butterflies. They will be all over that. They just love moist, rich, soggy soil. Butterflies, painted ladies to monarchs to swallowtails and everything in between, they'll be all over it. So you can attract or bring the wildlife into your backyard simply by using water. Rock doesn't do it. And so if you've rocked over everything, that's almost going to repel wildlife. You want to have certain spots, clusters, or islands in your gardens where they just kind of feel safe. They're resting. There's water and food, and they feel protected. And so your little birds can get in there, and they chitter-chat like crazy, and they're protected from the kestrels that dive down and try to get after them. So there's, I've got, it's fun to watch all of it. I mean, nature's fun and cruel and brutal and all at the same time, but they're all magical. And so I don't mind is to watch a, a red-tailed hawk soaring over or a blue heron in my pond. I don't, I, they're, they're predators, hardcore, but I don't mind that because they're beautiful and it's like an honor to have them in, in your gardens. And then they, they move on, they, they, they go elsewhere. So watch the watering of your plants, but also of your birds, of your backyard, of your, the animals that are back there. Everything starts to get parched right now. You can feel it in your lips. If you don't have lip gloss or, or some sort of chapstick on your lips, they dry out. Your plants do exactly the same thing. For my really new plants, kind of a, if you get really specialized, I use wilt stop. It's a liquid It's a that you coat new foliage with, and it keeps it from drying out. It's like a sunblock for plants. We sell it at the gardens, and it's called wilt stop. But you spritz it on your ivies, on brand new plants. Anytime that's brand new in the ground, I spritz it with wilt stop. Stops them from wilting, stops it from drying out, getting stressed out, locks it in, locks all the moisture in place, and it just thrives. Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners, we hang out here at Waters Garden Center throughout the week. We love talking to friends. If you want a more fruitful garden, increase success in your landscape that just feels better, then tune in every week to the Mountain Gardener. Years of tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts are guaranteed to make your gardens nicer than ever. Listen to this podcast or read Ken's weekly garden column by visiting watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Thanks for tuning in.